Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's good to be back home. In the period of about uh, 12 days, we put 4,000 miles or more on the car, plus a flight to Nashville and back. Uh, my arms are really tired from that flight. Bad job. Bad job. Turn to the book of Romans, please. Wednesday night, Greg and I were talking after the practice, realizing where we are in this year of the Bible. And we've just finished up the uh, just the last half of the chapter of Acts and then gone into the book of Romans. And I thought, you know, there's there's a drawback to the way that we're doing this. The reading for this week was chapters 1 to 6 from Romans. You get one message on six chapters. When Robin Elmer and their Tuesday night Bible study taught Romans, it took five to seven years to go through the book. So you're going to get a lot of condensed information this morning. I'm going to give you a little background, and then we're going to look at three different doctrines. I want to give you a principle first that... Uh, and it's the reason that I'm doing it the way that I'm doing it. What I say is of little value. But what God says is of high value. The writer, writer of Hebrews says, For the word of God is living, active, and sharper than any two-edged sword, and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit, of both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. heart. When we talk to people, uh, Greg this morning in Sunday school read a passage from 2 Timothy. It says, preach the word, be ready in season and out. Uh, it doesn't say, tell stories. It says, preach the word. So what you're going to hear this morning is a lot of word. Because the power is in the word. Not in my word, but in his word. Just a little background. Uh, as you know, the writer of, of Romans was Paul the Apostle, and he wrote to the church that was in Rome. Now, one of the commentaries that I read actually attributed the, the founding of the church in Rome to Paul, even though he'd never been there. And the, the way they justified that or, or made it sound plausible was that it was through those that Paul taught and discipled that went to Rome and began the church. So in a sense, Paul, by proxy, started the church in Rome. That was their, that was their theory. It's kind of a good principle, because when you think about it, we support certain missionaries around the world. We're not able to go to the country that Lauren's in. And yet, because of the work that she's doing and are praying for her and supporting her, we are taking part in that ministry. And I think in, in heaven, when we get there, part of our rewards will be that this church participated in that ministry. Same way with Every Home for Christ, with Casas por Cristo, um, or, um, and I never can pronounce his name, in, just over in Texas. DACA. DACA, yes. DACA and Heather. Um, and then others that you support. So as we support missionaries, we pray for them and support them financially. Uh, we are also taking part in that ministry, and I think we will be rewarded for that. The primary subject of the book of Romans is the righteousness of God. One of the uh, commentaries suggested this particular outline. 
The first doctrine, that would be representative of faith. Then dealing with Israel, and that would be representative of hope. And duty, the last third, representative of love. So you get faith, hope, and love. Does that sound familiar? We see that in Corinthians. Faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Love, yes. Look at chapter 1. Starting with verse 18. We're going to talk about the doctrine of sin. Of course, we all know that in Genesis 3, chapter 1, we'll get there in a minute, John. Hold on. In Genesis 3, 6, 3, 6, we see where sin first came into the world, and that was with Adam. And Paul, as he goes through this book of Romans, uh, expounds, uh, expands on that, what happened. Chapter 1, verse 18. I'm going to read, and then I'll make some comments as we go along. It says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world is invisible attributes, how can you see something invisible? Yet there is that inner <coughs> awareness, if you will, an inner vision of a creator God. His invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. You ever look at the eye? Look at a diagram of the eye? And to think that the eye, that complex thing that it is, started out as a muck in the mud and developed and developed and developed and developed and became an eye. That takes faith. Faith in the wrong thing. Look at your hand. The hand is a, a a marvelous invention, if you will. It's a marvelous tool. Jim, what could you do if you didn't have a thumb? Very little. For those of you that type, if you didn't have a thumb, you'd have a hard time with a space bar. But it gives us the ability to grasp. These things have been understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. The world is without excuse. Mankind is without excuse. You've probably heard the argument, well, what about the, the native and the deepest, darkest parts of Africa? nature around that person? Can they not see the stars in the heavens, the planets that are visible, the beauty of nature, and to think that all of that just either just happened, came out of the muck, that uh, a friend that was in one of our Bible studies years past and was in college and the professor was talking about the Big Bang Theory and he knew that this guy was a believer and so he's kind of picking at it and John stands up and he says, Professor, I believe in the Big Bang Theory and he goes, what? You do? Yes. God said, bang and it happened. Uh, that isn't exactly how it happened. But he spoke the word and everything came into existence. They're without excuse. Verse 21. 
For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks. But they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Good example of a darkened heart. Go back and read Exodus. Look at Pharaoh. He hardened his heart. He darkened his heart. And finally God said, okay, you want a dark heart? I'll give you a dark heart. 22. Professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. Think of the passage in the Old Testament where they talk about taking a piece of wood, cut it in half, and with half he formed a god, and with the other half he cooked his dinner. He'd have been better off cooking his dinner with one and then cooking his dinner with the other one, because that's about the only thing that it was effective for. They think they're wise, but they're not. 24. Therefore God gave them over in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, that their bodies might be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. In our culture, we don't necessarily have carved idols, but we do have idols. It might be money, it might be fame, it might be sex, relationships, a lot of different things that we put before God which means we are worshiping them. Twenty-six. We see this more and more and more every day. For this reason God gave them over to degrading passions. For their women exchanged the natural function for that which is unnatural. And in the same way also the men abandoned the natural function of the woman and burned in their desires towards one another, men with men committing indecent acts, and receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error. And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind to do those things which are not proper, being filled with all unrighteousness. All you have to do is turn the TV on, and you can see the example examples of unrighteousness, of wickedness going on, of greed and malice, envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice again. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, inventors of evil. They don't just practice what has been evil all along. They invent new things. Disobedient to parents without understanding. <coughs> Excuse me. Without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful. And although they know the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but also give hearty approval to those who practice them. Today Christians are called intolerant because the definition of tolerance has changed. It used to be, if you want to do what you want to do, you're fine even though it's wrong. Now it's, if, if I do something wrong, you have to approve it. And that's, what, and that's what Paul wrote, clear back to almost 2,000 years ago. Not just giving, letting the other do what they want to do, but requiring us to say that it's okay. We have no standards in this world, in the world. 
in the church we do. But the world wants us to take the same stance. If it's right for me, it's right. If it's right for you, it's right. But it may be wrong. Paul wrote in Ephesians, Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. They are disobedient. They are disobedient to God. In many cases, they're disobedient to the law. And many times, the law is disobedient to what's right. I've talked of designing a bumper sticker. Legal on one side, right on the other side, with an equal sign in the middle and a line drawn through the middle, through the equal sign. Legal does not equal right. And there's one area that, that stands out the most, and that's abortion. Turn to chapter 2, verse 5. But because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourselves in the day of in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. They're storing up wrath. They're, they're adding coal to the fire, if you will. Chapter three. We're going to skip around a lot. Chapter three, verse ten. M to 12. Here Paul is quoting Psalms. It says, There is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. Drop down to verse 18. There is no fear of God before their eyes. We did a study of Revelation, which took us about, what, Jan, three and a half years? Something like that. Near the end of Revelation, the wrath is being poured out, and instead of the people acknowledging their sin and bowing down before God, they're actually standing clenched fist, and this is my picture anyway, clenched fist, shaking it at God for the things that he's doing to them. There's no repentance. There's, there's, they're callous. Verse 23, this is one of the first verses I ever, ever memorized. Romans 3.23. Many of you could probably quote it along with me. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Who sinned? Most of us. Well, everybody but me. Um, well, maybe not Greg. Certainly not Ken. Cal? No, it says all. And that's the funny thing about all. When all says all, it means all. <laughs> Chapter 5, verse 12. Here he's referring back to, to Adam. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world, and death through sin... So death spread to all men because all sin. 17, first part. For if by the transgression of one, death reigned through the one. 19. For as through the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. Now there it sounds like there might have been some exceptions. But there wasn't. There wasn't. We are all sinners. We were born sinners. We lived 
whatever part of our life before Christ as sinners. Paul wrote 1 Corinthians 15, 21 to 22. For since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die. We all die. Because Adam died. Because Adam took that fruit, and it wasn't an apple, he took that fruit and he ate it. He's the reason we were born sinners. Not Eve. Eve was deceived. I have a picture of that in my head. Satan is there, this beautiful serpent, upright, handing Eve the fruit. And she takes and she eats because it's desirable to look at, desirable to know more. And Adam's right there. And Adam knows the command. You can eat from every tree in the garden except one. And he's standing right there. And he's like Kenny used to be when Randy would do something. He'd stand back and see, well, if she gets in trouble, I won't do it. But if she doesn't get in trouble, then I'd go ahead and do it. And I believe Adam stood there and watched Eve, and when she didn't immediately keel over dead, he thought, oh, it must be okay. So he took a bite. Because of that, still in verse, still in chapter 5, we need to be justified. And this is the continuation, or actually going on from verse 23, where it said, uh, Excuse me, 324, not five. Look at my notes, I might do that. Chapter 3, verse 24. Being justified is a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation, that's a covering, that's a great big word, it just means covering, in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness because of the forbearance of God he passed over the sins previously committed for the demonstration I say of his righteousness at the present time that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus how are we justified we are justified by the one who is just and that's Jesus Christ he justifies us now, I can remember years back when in the discipleship group I was in that we would, we would remember justified by saying, it's just if I'd never sinned. A lot of people probably learned that to try to remember justified. And then I heard a message. Oh, it's, it's been years ago now too, but not that far. And that's not really true. God doesn't look at us at us, justified not still at say, look at me, justified never sinned, because I sinned. He looked at me as justified because of what Jesus did that made me just. So I am a forgiven sinner. My sins are forgiven. The past is forgiven, as Greg talked about with communion, and I am justified. Chapter 4, verse 25. He who was delivered up because of our transgression, notice he, Jesus, was delivered up because of whose transgression? Ours. And was raised because of our justification. God raised Jesus from the dead so that he could justify us. Chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. 
therefore, now you all know what a therefore is there for. When you see a therefore, you look back to see what the there is there for. And he went through all of this about sin and, and just on and on and on and on and on. And he gets to chapter 5. It says, therefore, having been justified by faith. By faith? What's faith? What's faith?
starting in verse 1. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace might increase? It's a logical question. If grace abounds where sin abounds, shouldn't we sin more to get more <coughs> grace? One of our associate pastors back in Sacramento used to sing a song. I was sinking deep in sin. Whee! No. Paul answers that in verse 2. May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore we have been buried with him through baptism into death, in order that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. Corinthians talks about being a new creation. Verse 5. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this that our old self was crucified with him, that our body of sin might be done away with, that we, no long, that we should no longer be slaves to sin, for he who has died is freed from sin. Think of that in terms of sanctification. We are freed from sin. We are set apart from sin for God for his use. Verse 8. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Death no longer is master over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. And I have a note, eternally. Even so, consider yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let me reword that. Even so, consider yourselves sanctified, alive to God. Verse 12. Therefore, therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey its lusts. And do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under law but under grace. We're not to be slaves to sin. Sin is not to be our master. We're not set apart to sin. We are set apart to from sin. Verse 15. Sounds like a question we just saw. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? Paul's answer. May it never be. 16. Do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey? either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness. But thanks be to God that through you, excuse me, that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. And having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh, for just as you presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, resulting in further lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, resulting in sanctification. We were born sinners. We needed to be justified. And the only way we could be justified was through the death, burial, crucifixion, death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. We celebrate, celebrate that with the Lord's table. We were justified. As a result of us being justified, God wants us to be sanctified, mm. to be set apart for His use. I have two verses to, to close with. If you stand with me, please, as I read these two verses. 
One is from Romans, one is from Ephesians. Thus saith the Lord from his holy word. Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Some versions say reasonable. Therefore I, prisoner of the, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. Amen. Next week's fellowship dinner. Have a good week. Remember, you are justified. Therefore, you should be sanctified. Go in, go in your sanctification. Let it show.